the second century BC. A Chinese football game, Guju, appeared first in the Qin and Han Dynasty. However, they didn't make their balls the way we do today. Theirs was a pouch of leather stuffed with feathers and wool. During the classical age, ball games were also popular. The ancient Greeks, for example, played Episkiros, and the ancient Romans played Harpistum, but the balls they used were heavy and filled with sand. Up to the 19th century, the Europeans used, well, what options did they really have? A ball filled with sand is too heavy, and it doesn't fly well. A ball stuffed with wool and feathers doesn't bounce very well. What material was best for making a light and elastic bladder? Hmm. Yes, of course, a natural one, the bladder of a pig or a bull. They were used to create balls for centuries. They were first dried and processed, then inflated and covered with leather from the same pig or bull. And the result was this lumpy, ugly ball. It's all due to the shape of the bladders. They're not perfectly round and durable. Only the invention of rubber bladders allowed us to make a smooth, strong soccer ball. Unlike this weird thing with a totally unpredictable trajectory. The modern design soccer ball appeared thanks to a good year. Good year. Get it? No. Charles Goodyear, American inventor, the man who turned this natural rubber into this modern rubber animation. Actually, the rubber was brought to Europe after the second expedition of Columbus, wherein the Spanish saw the locals on the island of Haiti during a ritual game kicked around a ball made of a dark elastic material. And this ball bounced much better than its leather counterparts in the old world. This ball was made from a natural rubber. Here it is, the dried milky latex from a para rubber tree. Among other agricultural innovations from the new world, rubber was instantly brought back to Colombia's homeland. Back home, this new material was used for the production of shoes, bags, waterproof clothing, bottles, and of course, balls. Thought at the time they were made of one piece, but an important characteristic of natural rubber was quickly discovered. It readily reacts to temperature changes. When it was hot out, the ball became sticky and soft. When it was cold, it was hard and brittle. Who would want to play with a ball that's too sticky in the summer and crumbles to bits in the winter? Rubber was forgotten for half a century until it had a good year. What are the parts of a soccer ball? There are three layers. The air bladder, inner lining, and the outer shell. It's that simple. Now that we've learned about the bladder, it is still today made of rubber, although sometimes it is made from synthetic butyl. From the outside, they are barely distinguishable. The inner lining is the frame to support the bladder. It helps to maintain the shape of the ball and improves its bounce. The lining is made of cotton and polyester. But as for the cover, or shell, the only suitable construction material used to be, yes, only a natural one. And so the cover was made of leather, which had to be laced together. The air valve for filling the bladder was hidden underneath it. Real 100-year-old balls are kept in museums, but this is a modern replica, historically accurate with leather with lacing. Well, let's hear some athletes' opinion if this ball is good or not. While they are playing, here is a spoiler. 
If you don't want to hear it, skip the next 30 seconds of the video or cover your ears, okay? The leather ball was bad. Its pieces were cut from different parts of a cow's hide and different patterns were used for the stitching. As a result, it's impossible to create a perfect sphere. And then there's the problem that natural leather readily absorbs water. If it was raining or snowing, the ball would become heavy and wouldn't bounce well. And this lacing hurt the athletes when they hit it with their heads. When you catch a modern soccer ball, you can feel it's tougher. The soccer balls of the past were too soft, and because of this, it's difficult to focus on catching it. Also, when there's a shot, the ball moves in random directions because it's too light. A heavier ball would be more stable. Even if there are unfavorable weather conditions for playing football, like strong winds or rain, a modern ball will fly in the direction you kick it. But this one behaves differently. I mean, the wind plays an important role in the direction of its flight. So its trajectory is unpredictable? Absolutely unpredictable. In 1863, the Football Association was established in England. It unified the rules of the game, including the parameters for the ball, although they were later changed. It's difficult to imagine now, but until 1963, the size and weight of the ball were determined through a mutual agreement between the athletes. If everyone thought the ball was suitable, there would be a match. But if someone didn't like the ball, the match wouldn't take place. In 1872, regular football games began to be held. Football associations appeared, and we can say that the actual birth of the ball occurred. The ball was heavier and tougher. The circumference was from 27 to 28 inches. The weight could range from 368 to 425 grams. In 1937, the weight increased to between 400 and 450 grams. But all modern standards were broken by the imperfect covers of those soccer balls. During matches, it became egg-shaped due to kicks, moisture, or production flaws. It became heavier. The lacing hit the players, and the goalkeeper was constantly misled by its unpredictable trajectory. Until finally, one goalkeeper couldn't take it anymore. Egel Luis Marius Ferdinand Nielsen was born in Denmark in 1918 into a large working class family. At the age of 20, he made his debut as the goalkeeper of the football club Copenhagen, the oldest club in the country. His team won five championships in Denmark, and the team which included Nielsen won the bronze medal in the 1948 Olympics. He had many trophies, like all elite players of the 1940s. Nielsen didn't really like the balls back then, and as a goalkeeper, he frankly hated their unpredictability. After all, soccer balls often flew towards the goal with a totally unpredictable flight path. To cut a long story short, Nielsen couldn't stand it anymore. First, this tireless Dane began experimenting with leather and trying to pick best pieces. He moisturized and stretched them to prevent them from deforming. He also added a new component to the bladder, a tiny valve. He removed this annoying scar from the surface of the ball. But his final achievement in his research was the creation of a 32-panel ball using 12 identical pentagons and 20 identical hexagons. In geometry, this shape is called a truncated icosahedron, the polygon the most similar to a sphere. There's no way to create a perfect sphere from separate panels. Eagle Nielsen was ahead of his time, so to speak. He invented the ball in 1946 and called it the Select. It turned out to be better than any attempts made by various other manufacturers. The 32-panel design is still the most popular in the world. In 1968, 
Adidas produced the official ball based on this design for the European Football Championship and again in 1970 for the World Cup. For the ever more popular television broadcast, which was mostly black and white, the panels were painted in contrasting colors so that the ball would be easier to distinguish on the screen. 12 black pentagons and 20 white hexagons. This is how the classic look first came to be, which you can find in all emoji keyboards today. It was named after a satellite, the Telstar. The Telstar satellite resembles the Telstar ball about as much as I resemble Brad Pitt. Which is to say we're both human beings and the, the similarities in there. Here the solar panels are square and the closer to the ends rectangular. No pentagons or hexagons. The satellite didn't work for a very long time either. Less than a year before it broke down. Now it's just space debris. The Telstar ball was recognized as the roundest for its time. It was used during the 72 and 76 European Championships, and again during the 74 World Cup in West Germany. Today, more than half a million of its replicas have been sold. And so, with the intention of unlocking the secret to curved shots, we bought a cheap ball, which is very similar to the one invented by Eagle Nielsen and popularized by Adidas. This 32-segment style is still in fashion even 70 years later. So why does a round ball fly in a curved path when it hits straight on? Yes, because it's spinning, but every ball rotates in flight. How do players manage to curve its path, a phenomenon which is especially noticeable in a corner kick? This simple experiment should explain everything. So, I went to the roof of a 19-story building. I secured myself with safety equipment. I went to the very edge. It's a little scary. I was at a height of about 200 feet. First, I'm going to drop the ball straight down. I will throw it a little forward. One, two, three. The ball is blown around slightly by the wind, but it lands on almost the same spot under where it was thrown. Now, one more throw. Now I'm going to spin it a little bit towards myself. I didn't even throw it far away from me. I just slightly spun it and the ball flew away. It landed 60 feet away from the building. Now let me explain what happened. Our ball was affected by the Magnus effect, named after Henrik Gustav Magnus, who described this phenomenon in 1852. Here's how it works. When the ball is accelerating, the oncoming airflow begins passing around it. If the ball isn't spinning, then the airflow flows around all sides of it at the same speed. But if it's spinning, the ball also influences the airflow, here in the same direction on the oncoming flow, and here in the opposite direction. Here, there is the airflow speed plus the spinning speed. And here, there is the airflow speed minus the spinning speed. And now we are running into Bernoulli's principle. The higher the flow speed, the lower the pressure. A ball, like any flying object, cannot escape this law of physics, and it obediently moves toward the lower pressure zone. When I threw the ball off the roof, I spun it towards myself. As a result, the pressure was bigger here and smaller here, so the ball landed far from the building. The Magnus effect applies to all rotating spherical and cylindrical bodies in the air, including soccer balls. Do you want to confuse the goalkeeper and make the ball fly along a curved path? Kick here, here, or here. And if you score a goal, shout Magnus Effect! Well, what are we going to do for natural materials, hmm? Yes, the ball has evolved, become stronger, become an almost perfect sphere. 
but it couldn't part ways with leather. Perhaps this is the most unexpected thing. If you are a football expert, try to answer correctly. Which country today is the biggest producer of soccer balls? India, China, Turkey, or Pakistan? Your answer? Wrong. The correct answer is Pakistan. This might come as a shock. Almost 80% of all soccer balls in the world are made in Pakistan. And half of the 80% of these balls are produced in one northeastern city called Sialkot. This is the world center for soccer ball production. Everyone here produces them. Why Pakistan? And why does this city produce more balls than any other place in the world? Well, there are several possible explanations. According to one version, Pakistan, once part of British India, was famous for its master leather crafters. So they had enough skilled labor to produce these perfect spheres for a purely English sport. According to another version, in Selkut, British officers decided they wanted to play football. Naturally, they eventually punctured their ball. And of course, they could not fix it themselves. They gave it to a local tradesman, and he handled the task. Then he began producing soccer balls himself, and his business grew from there. Hey! Here, here! Well, however it happened, if you take your soccer ball and find the made-in label, most likely you will see Pakistan. This is Sergei, the only master tradesperson in Moscow who can fix or completely sew a soccer ball. No one else can do that, not even a factory. The next nearest place to repair a ball is 500 miles from Moscow. Why is there nobody who can sew soccer balls? As far as I know, many of the people I knew who knew how to do it are dead now or can't work anymore. Yeah, and then doing this kind of work, it's not easy to make a good living. Then why do you do it? My father did it and I kind of inherited it from him. That's why I do this. It doesn't matter if I want it or not, I do it. How much does it cost to repair a ball? If you already have a spare bladder, then it costs $10. If you don't, it costs $15. But you know, when a new ball costs about $60 to $80, 20% of the price isn't such a high price to pay for a repair. For many people, a soccer ball can hold many memories. Some people can bring them from Spain or France, or it might be a souvenir ball. We asked Sergei to show us how to create a soccer ball from scratch. Process is simple, albeit time consuming. First, a hexagonal panels are sewn to a pentagonal panel until it turns into a flower. When there are enough of them, they are all sewn together into a solid shell. It is turned inside out and through a small hole the bladder is inserted. Then it is glued to the valve and the hole through which the bladder was inserted is sewn shut. But these final steps are kind of a secret. Sergei does not want anyone to see how he completes them. Why do you decidedly refuse to show how the last stitches are made to finish the ball? I'd say it's not the last stitch, but the last knot that I don't want to show. The biggest reason I don't reveal it is that I promised my father I wouldn't. Yeah. He said, tell this secret only to your son. Your son and no one at all. Not even to your best friend. Today, he is your best friend and tomorrow he might become your enemy. So, I made a promise with my father and I keep my word. I don't know what could make me break my promise. So what about those natural materials, hmm? 
Ah yes, leather. No matter how it's treated, we'll still absorb some moisture, which will make a soccer ball heavier. Yes, things have gone or rather flown a long way. In the early 1960s, the first ball was made using polyurethane and artificial leather. Compared to natural leather, it was way more durable and completely waterproof. By the late 80s, genuine leather outer shells had completely disappeared. Then why do so many people say that natural ingredients are the best, hmm? Hey, get out of here! Bloody butcher! Modern high-tech soccer balls are made of plastic. And they are not even sewn. Their parts are fused together thermally to achieve even smoother seams. The different cover designs and coloring have their own names. For example, the ball for the World Cup in Russia is called the Telstar 18. And as you can see, the design is somewhat similar to the ball with the same name that we discussed earlier. Learn, fall in love, buy, be surprised. There are so many tactics people have tried in their attempts to get closer to the ideal. That simple round sphere.